Okay, I'm going to get started because uh, I'm sure we're all eager to get out of here. Um, it's been a long day. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. It's a much more full room than I expected for second to last session of the day. Um, I'm here to talk to you um, about um, a tool that we built at my company, Aptio. Um, first, I'm going to introduce myself a little bit um, and tell you two things about this slide deck. Um, Firstly, I thought it was a good idea to hand draw them and then realized I was absolutely terrible at drawing and my handwriting is like a toddler. So I apologize if anybody can't um, actually make these slides out. And the second thing that I will say is that there is a demo here and I know there was uh, some comments about I should have re you should record a video um, on Twitter. I didn't do that. So um, if it goes terribly, I will hold my hands up. Um, so this is not just about the tool that we built, this is also a story. And it's a story about how we went through a process of grief at Aptio. We had a problem and we didn't really understand how we were the only people having this problem. And I'm fairly sure even now that we're not the only people having this problem. But we wrote a tool and we did something that we said we were never going to do. We wrote a tool to solve a problem that was just for us. And then we open sourced it, and here I am talking to you about it today. Um, so the story begins back in 2016. Um, the way that we deployed our applications at Aptio was shit, for want of a better word. And that deployment system still lives to this day. It was actually decided that we weren't going to support that deployment system in 2015, and it's still around now. Um, so if, if, that, if that tells you um, something, then you know, I, I would say that um, people really don't want to maintain and manage deployment software. Um, it's not a sexy task that anybody really wants to do. Um, and that deployment software is a Java server and a Java agent that wraps around some bash scripts. And it works, and it isn't broken, uh, but nobody really likes it. So back in 2016, there was conversation that had um, around how we deploy software, and we had a conversation that said, well, we probably want to put our software in Docker containers, and running lots of Docker containers is hard, so let's try Kubernetes. And Kubernetes was by no means as stable and as battle-tested as it is today, but we started on this journey around that time. And so we built a Kubernetes cluster. And you know, I really like that this talk is following on from what uh, Matthias, or Matthias, however you say his name, um, talked about previously. Provisioning a Kubernetes cluster is a very crowded space right now. If you go to the CNCF and look at how many different ways you can provision a Kubernetes cluster, I think we're into the, the dozens at this point. Um, we chose the things that we knew. We chose Puppet because we know it. We have a lot of people at our company that know Puppet inside out. And we use KubeADM because KubeADM at the time said, we have built this tool that is going to be used for configuration management tools to deploy Kubernetes clusters. Um, there are other options out there now. I'm not necessarily sure we would choose that if we did it again. Uh, but it actually works. It's very robust. And I think seeing the, the Tarmac talk before this, uh, in which they use Puppet and a bunch of other Go-based uh, wrappers, um, you know, kind of validates that decision a little bit. So we built our first cluster. And we ended up with this wonky, diamond-shaped cluster that kind of worked. And then we realized that a Kubernetes cluster on its own, provisioned and running in your infrastructure, isn't actually that usable. Um, in order to make it usable, in order for you developers to enjoy it and like using it, you actually have to put a bunch of stuff on top of that. And if you're lucky enough to use Google Cloud, you get all that for free. But we used AWS, and EKS was a twinkle in Amazon's eye at this point. Um, and you know, people who use EKS now will actually say that it is still relatively behind many of the other cloud providers. So we came along, and we put a bunch of stuff on top of our development cluster. We put an ingress controller. We put external DNS, which is the really cool technology that allows you to automatically update, update DNS when you get a new ingress. We use Bitnami sealed secrets so that we can actually have those secrets can only be decrypted inside the cluster. Um, and the way that we did this, the way that we installed all those things, is the tried and tested method, Helm. Helm was the thing at that time 
that made sense for us to install these, these tools because we had a single cluster and we just needed to do two commands, helm init and then helm install, whatever the name of the chart is, and it appeared. And we kind of like this, you know, helm was, helm is and remains an extremely useful idea, a package manager for Kubernetes. But have you ever tried to get a merge request merged into the Helm Charts repository? At the time, when we were doing this, this was much higher. I was actually surprised to go to the Helm Charts repository today and, and notice how much work the Helm community has put into to automated testing and, and getting these Helm Charts really stable and easy. But at the time when we were going through this process, we would find a bug in a Helm Chart and we would just, the shoulders would drop when you realized that you had to fork the chart and have your own Helm chart repo. And this is the first stage of the grief process, denial. We were in denial at this point. Like we have a Kubernetes cluster, but we're doing all this manual, terrible work to actually get these charts installed. And you know, then there's the, also the, the part of it that, you know, if you, if you look at some of the hot takes about Helm right now and how Helm is a security nightmare and Tiller is root on your cluster and people, the people that were working on this, you know, we, we felt this real sense of unease and denial about how this process was looking. It only got worse because we added more clusters. You can't just have a dev cluster. A lot of people do. But in an enterprise environment, you cannot have a single cluster and separate things by namespace. You have to have more logical separation than that, especially if you service users over a wide variety of geographical regions. So we added a dev cluster, and we added another prod cluster, and we added another prod cluster. And all of the things that we needed to make our clusters usable, ingress controllers, sealed secrets, Prometheus, all of the other things that were required to make those clusters work and be usable, we had to install it all again. And it all came to a head one day when, when one of our developers asked us, hey, why is my external DNS not updating? Like I deployed it into dev one, and I deployed it into dev two, and then I deployed it into prod one, and it all worked, but prod two isn't working properly. And it turns out that somebody, who shall remain nameless, and yeah, it was me, um, put the wrong configuration into the external DNS tool inside Kubernetes prod two, and it wasn't working. And we didn't know until we did an upgrade. And this sounded familiar to me. This sounded extremely familiar. To, um, you know, I've been doing this system administration game for eight, nine years. My colleagues have been doing it even longer than that. And, you know, Eric did a keynote, and this is stage one of configuration management. This is snowflake clusters. We used to have snowflake servers, but now, we had the same problem. We had snowflake clusters. And we couldn't believe it. We were like, oh, we thought we'd solved this problem. This problem has been solved for us for years and years and years. We have configuration management tools to deal with this problem. And here we are again, going through the same pain points. So we went back to what we know again. And we use Puppet. And Puppet has a Helm um, Puppet module. And so we went down this path and we said, hey, install this Helm chart and install this version. And we use Hira across different regions and across different versions and all that kind of stuff. Um, it gave us that configurability, that data um, that's separate from the actual code. And we started installing Helm charts this way rather than manually. But here's the thing with Puppet. It doesn't actually know what a Kubernetes cluster is. And I've intentionally used the old Puppet Labs um, the old Puppet Labs logo here, because we are all on 3.8, let's be honest. Like, we're all still back in, in 2015. Um, but Puppet has no concept awareness of what a cluster is, and it doesn't actually know how to install things on a remote endpoint by default. I'm sure there are ways that you can, there are, sure, there are smart people out there who can make this work, but the way it was working for us is that we would run Puppet, it would compile a catalog on every single one of the masters, and we would end up in race conditions because there were two running at the same time. Some would try and remove a chart, and some would try and you know, install it. it. It just didn't work. And so we, we did what we always do in these situations. We asked ourselves the question, how is everyone doing this? We cannot be the only company that is running multiple Kubernetes clusters that is having this problem. So I did what any reasonable person with a Twitter account does. 
I wrote 100 tweets. No, I actually wrote a blog post because that's what you're supposed to do. That's what blogs are for. Um, if you find yourself making a tweet storm, please write a blog post, just as my little aside there. It's much easier to search for answers if it's not in Twitter's walled garden. Um, but we, I, I wrote a blog post, I think it's back in 2017 now, that said there is a growing need for Kubernetes configuration management. And I fully expected somebody to at me and be like, well, this is already solved. We wrote this really cool tool. And there was nothing. Silence, crickets. Nobody would seem to be having this problem. And if they were having this problem, they weren't sharing their solutions. So I Googled, like everybody does. And we looked at some of the solutions here. Um, we looked at Ksonnet. And I actually really think Ksonnet is a fantastic piece of, of tooling. Um, it's JSONnet, but it, it's very application focused. It's, it's more for individual applications and how you're going to deploy them. And we didn't want to deploy individual applications. We wanted to deploy lots of them. And we wanted to create this configuration, but for multiple clusters. And Ksonnet has a concept of environment, but it isn't really that cluster aware. It just looks at the cube context that you're in. Um, somebody floated the idea that we would just, why don't we just take the values.yaml that Helm uses and template it? And I was like, there's got to be a better way than that. You can't just keep putting templating systems on top of YAML. Um, we looked at Capitan, which was announced around this time. And again, it was YAMLs and, and Ginger 2 templates. And we looked at Ansible. And again, if you really want to template things in Ansible, you're going to have to use Ginger 2 templates. Why did we allow this to happen? Who made it acceptable? to template YAML. When did this happen and who is responsible? I'm, I'm going to have a personal vent here now. If you want to hand write configuration, use YAML. If you want to generate configuration with machines and code, use JSON. They are the same thing. You can convert between them really, really easily. Why are we doing this? We already solved this back in the day with things like Puppet. You can write a Puppet hash in a nice DSL and generate some JSON. It's really, really readable and really, really straightforward. When did this happen? If you are considering templating YAML, ask yourself the question, why you aren't generating JSON? Please. So the, the second stage of grief, acceptance. We're going to have to write something. There's nothing out there. There's no alternative for this. And I'm really hoping when I ask questions at the end, someone's going to put their hand up and go, you went through all this angst, and there's actually a really, really good solution. Please, if there is, I hope, I hope to hear about it at some point. So a colleague of mine who is much, much smarter than me, uh, Colin Spargo, based out of uh, Wollongong, Australia, um, he went off into his little mountain and disappeared for three days and came back with this tool. And it's actually, at the time, it was a bunch of bash scripts, and it was called create. And I think he was more proud of the, the name than he was the actual tool. Um, but the, the whole point of it was it would take a language that is specific for generating JSON in JSONit, so similar to and inspired by Ksonit, it would take a language that is specific to generating JSON manifests and JSON um, tooling, and it, it generates these configuration files for you. Um, it was originally, like I said, it was originally written in Bash. We rewrote parts of it in Go um, recently, and it's still in the process of rewriting all of it into Go and getting it out of Bash scripts. Um, but essentially, what it does is it consumes Kubernetes configuration, whether that be in a Helm chart, whether it be in JSONnet. If you look at some things like the Prometheus operator, you they recommend, in fact, that you don't use Helm charts; you use JSONnet. Um, you could take pure YAML. So if you want to deploy the guest book, you can just download that YAML, suck it into create, manipulate it in JSON, and then spit it back out again as a deployable manifest. Um, and you can also write pure JSON if you really want, really want if, you, if that's the, your kind of thing, if you want to hand write JSON. Um, but the, the key thing here is we wanted to keep it simple. We wanted to keep it straightforward. We wanted to use off-the-shelf tools wherever possible. So we use a bunch of other things like uh, go task instead of make to actually do the deployment. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a demo in a couple minutes um, about how this works. But the main thing here is that we wanted to just take this configuration for these components that need to go into a cluster to make it usable and then spit out manifest, but make them different 
depending on which cluster name you're using. So if you have a cluster in the EU and a cluster in Asia and a cluster in, the, in North America, you want it to make very, very slight configuration changes. For example, we deploy the Nginx Ingress controller and we want to um, use a different certificate in dev and prod. We can now do that with create. So we just specify a parameter that says the path to the certificate in IAM and it generates a manifest with slightly different um, configuration. So a couple concepts to go through. There are two key concepts in create. A component. Um, this is just a term that we have used and we actually kind of stole it from case on it. But a component is a thing that you want to install on your cluster to make it usable. And I've got some examples here in my terrible toddler scrawl of the kind of things that you probably want to install on clusters. You want to Nginx ingress, Istio, Prometheus probably wants to be there. You might want a vault set up and all these things. External DNS. These are things that you would write and they are very similar to a Puppet module, to an Ansible role, or to a Terraform module. Um, and it's just a phrase for something similar to that. At the moment, you have to have all these components in the file system, but we're hoping to actually use HashiCorp's incredible Go Getter, uh, Go library, to, to be able to pull these down from external repos. So we should be able to split these things out. And then you have a cluster. And the clusters is just a directory in your configuration that looks very, very similar to, if you're familiar with Puppet and Hira, looks very, very similar in this kind of hierarchical um, concept. And we, we did it this way because it made sense to us, because Hira, Hira's hierarchy allows you to, to do things like have multiple development clusters underneath a, a configuration and multiple production clusters. Um, and all you have to do is have a cluster.json it inside, inside a directory, and create will traverse that directory and take everything above it and apply it to that configuration. So hopefully, this will make a little bit more sense if I do a demo. So I'm going to do a quick demo um, of um, how this works. Can everybody see that clearly? Not anymore, because it's gone off the screen. There we go. How's that looking? OK, cool. Um, so first of all, I have this directory. Um, and in here, I've got, obviously, a components directory, and a clusters directory, and a generated directory. There's also a metadata directory and a bunch of scripts that we use that need to come out of this. And I'm not going to focus on the components specifically, because what I'd rather do is write the documentation for that. But what I want to do is show you how you apply a component to a cluster. So if I look at the clusters directory here, you can see this is the hierarchy of clusters that I've got. And just for posterity's sake, I have three clusters, including the Docker one, which I'm not using. Um, I have three clusters that are deployed in DigitalOcean that are in different regions, one in dev and two for prod. Um, because I'm super secure, they're all in the same account. Um, but you can see here, like, there is this development directory with a dev1 cluster underneath it. There's a production uh, uh, directory with a params.json, and, and that's consumed by both of these below here in prod1 and prod2. So what I'm going to do is look at the actual declaration for this cluster. And I've added comments, and this is on GitHub, so you can go and have a look at it, to tell you about the required stuff in here. At the top here, we use a JSONnet um, uh, thing, which is the underscore, which is basically like a hidden, um, it's like a hidden variable almost, for want of a better word. And what we do here is we define some metadata about the cluster. So we know it's in the dev tier. We, it's in the AMS1 region in DigitalOcean, um, I give it a cluster name, and I give it a cluster type, DigitalOcean, and a DNS domain. And the reason that we define this metadata is you can actually then take that and use it in components. So for example, as part of the components, I can just grab that DNS domain for, it, uh, for the external DNS, and I don't need to actually specify it over and over again. The next section down is this component section. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying that I want the sealed secrets component to be installed on this cluster. And I've kind of cheated a little bit here because Sealed Secrets regenerates its manifest every single time. So what I did in, you know, prior to this demo is I installed Sealed Secrets and got it up and running. Um, and then you can see here, common it out, I'm going to install the external DNS component. And I, all I do is specify the path to that on the file system. And then slightly further down, you can see this is where I actually define the configuration 
for the external DNS component. So I set a couple of environment variables, a encrypted uh, API key and API email, which is encrypted by seal secrets. Uh, so I feel comfortable putting that in source code. And then I specify some options for the cloud player pro the Cloudflare provider, and then some prefixes that are actually needed for external DNS to work. Um, I can make these changes across clusters, and I'll show you that in a minute. But real quickly, first, what I wanted to do is just remove the comments, and I'm going to generate the actual manifest for this. So you can see here it's gone through all of the components that I want to have installed on this cluster, external DNS, sealed secrets, and Nginx ingress. And it's generating manifest for them. And you can see here that my Git repository is now dirty. So it's generating me manifest for the external DNS. And I can go and have a look at them. And you can see here it's set the API key. Um, it's, it's grabbed all this configuration, and what I obviously want to do now is deploy it. Um, there's two ways to deploy it, and I'm going to go through the, the better way in a minute. But for testing and for validation, we have this deployer script. And what it does is it just reads that generating manifest. This is essentially kubectl apply, but we actually use kubectfg, um, which is part of the case sonnet libraries, because it allows you to do things like diffing. So if I do a diff here. It's telling me that there's been differences found between what's deployed in the cluster and what's in the local manifest. So now I'll just do an update. And I've obviously screwed up the configuration. <laughs> um, so it's actually giving me a config error, but it has actually deployed that external DNS there. OK? Right. So to go a little bit further, we have the prod and the dev clusters as well. So if I look at this top level directory, you can see here this is applied to all clusters below this. So Nginx ingress is installed. And if I look at just the pr production configuration, I want to have external DNS installed here. But what I want to have is different domains available. So I can override this for production instead of just development. So you'll notice here there's a difference between the domains that I'm using. And because we use seal secrets, and the secrets are cluster specific, I can then set the actual environment variables inside that cluster. So this will then take all of the configuration for an individual cluster, all of the configuration for production, and all the configuration for global, and apply it and generate a manifest. So I'm just going to real quickly. Uncomment this and uncomment this. And then I'm going to generate the configuration for all the clusters. And so that's gone through all of the clusters that I have defined. It's gone through all the components that are defined in those clusters. And it's going to generate me manifest for them. And the best way to actually check this is just do a quick diff in the generated directory. And you can see here, unfortunately, it's not very clear on the screen because of the wrapping. But you can see here that all I've done between prod and dev is add a new DNS domain. But that's vital if you want to have different configuration between clusters. And it gets way, way more complex than those single configuration options. You can do things like. Um, Patch, the, patch things depending on which namespace you are and, and lots of other interesting things. But the, the key thing to look at here is that the configuration between dev and prod is com completely different but the same. And this, is com this should be completely, uh, I, I don't know how you say this word, idempotent. So you should be able to run this over and over and over again and it doesn't change. Um, and I'll show you that actually in a better way by committing Nobody ever wanted to use Git live in front of their audience. Super verbose um, commit message there. So I'm going to regenerate there. And you can see it hasn't actually changed anything. It's kept my uh, working tree um, clean. Um, 
The final thing that I wanted to do is, I showed you the deployer script. Um, we firmly believe in this concept of GitOps when it comes to um, Kubernetes clusters, and I could do a whole talk on GitOps and the, the benefits and the, the, the great stuff about GitOps. But what's really, really nice is that there is, because these are deployable manifests, there is a way of actually deploying these manifests within the cluster without having to provide things like um, RBAC and, sorry, without having to provide things like secret tokens. So we check this into Git, and then we deploy a, a tool that I could never possibly claim credit for um, that's called Pharos. And Pharos is written by an organization called Pusher, and all it does is it downloads Git manifests and kubectl applies them. So I'm going to deploy this real quick. Actually, I probably need to actually enable it. Uh, clusters pro2. So you can see here it didn't actually generate me anything because I disabled it. Uh, all I'm doing here is specifying a subpath within this Git repo, so generated cluster name. Let's generate that. So you can see here it's generating me this component for this cluster. Check it in. And then the only thing that I should have to manually deploy is Pharos itself. So Pharos is being deployed into this production two cluster. Let me switch to it real quick. Lovely. See, I told you I hadn't, pr I hadn't practiced this. There we go. Um, so you can see here, it's creating the external DNS uh, for me. So if I was to make a change here and commit it into Git, it's actually adding the ingress controller too. Um, so I should be able to look at that real quick. And now my external DNS is running. Um, and for some reason, then terminating it again. Um, but it, the, the, the key thing here is that all I have to do is define the state of my cluster using create, commit it into a Git repository, and Pharos does the rest for me. So that was the demo. I'd call it a 50-50, half success, half, half not success. Um, so here's the third stage of this grief process, bargaining. This is not necessarily the best way to do this. And you know, Eric did a fantastic talk on the next generation of configuration management. I look around this room and I look at people who solve the idea of Snowflake hosts. I look at some people who have written things like Terraform and written Terraform modules who are able to define this um, configuration management but for different types of infrastructure. The configuration management space is still here. And, and, and I'll tell you a, a brief anecdote, and I know this is recorded, and somebody's going to get me upset, right? But I see developers who are doing DevOps, who are making the same mistakes we made seven years ago, eight years ago. They are writing scripts. It's a snowball, sorry, a, a, a mud ball of Bash and Python. And they're telling us we don't need configuration management because we don't do anything at the operating system layer. And I, I am asking and pleading for a call to arms. I personally believe that we have a very crowded space for configuration management when it comes to operating systems. But I couldn't find anything like this. I couldn't find anything for this abstraction layer of our infrastructure. And you know, I, I've had some hallway conversations from people who say, you know, I don't think we need containers. Containers aren't relevant. Containers are going to go away. We're all going to move back to bare metal eventually because it's more performant, and I want to do it this way, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and I, my personal belief is that we're all scared. And if you're a system administrator instead of a de developer, you might feel like your, your job is going away from you because everything's moving into Amazon. But Amazon's API is not declarative. Amazon's API needs some configuration management too. Terraform exists for exactly this reason, but now we're on Kubernetes clusters and we have the same problem. If you, in fact, uh, raise your hand if you are running a Kubernetes cluster right now in, in, at work. Keep your hand raised if you have more than three clusters. So people are feeling this problem, right? People are feeling this pain. 
you know, there, were, there was maybe 30, 40 people here in the room who raised their hand there. Um, these Snowflake clusters exist in the same way that Snowflake AWS accounts exist. And we have some very, very smart people at this conference who sat down eight or nine years ago and solved this problem. And I'm asking, please don't make me use this tool that I wrote. It's terrible. Like, it's, it's not that good. I, like, go and look at the code. It's really, really not that good, but it's the only thing that we could find. Um, so this is me bargaining with you. This is me asking and pleading, if you experience this problem, if you think that this is going to be something that is, is um, going to continue to be a problem for you in the future, either go and write something, help us write the tool that we have made and, and contribute to it, or think outside the box a little bit. Because, you know, these are all things that we need in Create right now. We don't have any unit tests. We're not developers. We're system administrators. Um, you know, you don't need tests in production. Um, we, you know, I wrote the documentation for this this morning. Um, if there is a better solution for this out there, then please, please help us. And hopefully, you know, I, I, I put a, put a, through a website together this morning, hoping that, you know, we could start some kind of uh, thought process around this. But if you believe that configuration management is a solved problem, you might be right. But that those same things that you, you and I learned five or six years ago, they need to be propagated into our DevOps engineers who believe that everything's going to be in AWS because we're making the same mistakes again. The same things are happening. We're still writing scripts that are one-offs that get checked into a Git repo, and I'm like, this is infrastructure as code. I wrote a Python script. That's not how it works. If that was the case, we'd all still be using Bash scripts that we wrote 10 years ago. So where can you find all this information? I did you all the favor of actually typing the links out rather than writing them by hand. Um, so Create is open source. Um, it's available on AppGeo's GitHub repo. Um, I have some example cluster config and the actual cluster configuration that I wrote for this talk is on my GitHub. Um, the original blog post um, that I wrote for the growing need for Kubernetes configuration management is on my blog, and then the initial announcement of Create back in November uh, is also up there as well. Um, and if you have a better solution to this, then please let me know and let's talk about it. Like, there has to be a better solution for this. Um, at the bottom there, you can see the site that I registered for Create Rocks, and I really wanted Create.io, and then was really disappointed when somebody had written the word blockchain on Create.io. I was like, damn it, I've lost here. Um, but this is where all this information is. I don't necessarily think this is the best solution. I don't necessarily think this is the only solution. But I think that we all need to start thinking about this configuration management and bring it into the next generation. And you know, Eric, uh, Eric, who sat at the front here, talked about this, and the Puppet Labs are thinking about it. I know that Terraform is a sol potential solution here. But the reason that the configuration management space is so well defined is because there are five excellent players here. The fact that we have a, a conference around configuration management for operating systems, and you could talk about Juju, Sol, Ansible, Puppet, all of these different tools, Chef, um, all of these different tools, they are all for, in my opinion, the operating system space. And we need to move that extra abstraction layer higher. We need to move it to, the, to, a, to a higher plane. So thanks for me, for, my, for listening to my grief. Um, if you want to talk more about this, I will be around for the rest of the day. Um, uh, please, you know, let me know. And if you have a, um, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the question now. Somebody, if you know a better way of doing this, raise your hand and tell me now. Over here.
not because uh, it was a small part of the magic, but because of the experience. Yeah. So when you start with uh, the side to side uh, of the magic with the with the three, of the four pencil part, where you start starting with the second step with the magician directly, it will be two and the band or the community will start to move to the two. Yeah. So now it's like the concert of the whole thing. I'm, I'm going to go backwards through the things that you just mentioned there because I think, first of all, the documentation, I, I will put it on there, I promise you. It will be done by next week, I promise. Um, Operator Lifecycle Manager was really, really interesting to us when we were going through this pro process, but there was a concern from some people that they don't necessarily want to write operators and have to be you know, embedded into complex reconcile code um, necessarily to get things done in a Kubernetes cluster. Um, you know, I, I understood that, and I, I, I do think that Operator Lifecycle Manager, like an operator of, oper of operators, is really, really great. But, you know, for us, we wanted to use the off-the-shelm Helm charts and then just slightly make some changes. Um, before that, you mentioned Helmsman. Helmsman is really, really cool, and I feel like if we um, didn't want to just use Helm charts, specifically just Helm charts, we would definitely use Helmsman. I think there's also a thing called Helm File um, by Robol, who is you know a big player in this. I don't know, actually know uh, his real name. But Helm File is another thing that's really cool here. Um, and I think we would have gone down that route if we hadn't looked at Prometheus. And Prometheus actually says, pr the premium Prometheus operator actually says, please use the JSON it where you can because it's more powerful and more flexible. Uh, and then finally, uh, We've Worked Flux is something that we looked at for the automatic deployment. but from what I saw at the time, um, it was only specific to individual applications. So we actually use Weave Workflux for some of our developers to deploy their applications, uh, and they love it because it means they just git get commit and their applications there. What it doesn't do is a wide range of applications across a wide range of clusters, in my experience, and we probably didn't look at it properly there. Um, but you know, I think they're all fantastic points, and I think the, you know, some of those things, the operator lifecycle manager specifically, could definitely be taken uh, into the next level and actually be thinking about this kind of stuff. Like a Helm operator would be really, really interesting, or just a kubectl apply operator would be really, really interesting. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate all those things as well. Uh, anybody else? Questions while we're here? No? OK. Well, thanks very much. Oh, wait, no. Back in the, in the middle at the back there. Um, so the three people who operate the Kubernetes cluster, I'm going to call them three and a half because one person of, you know contributes half of their time. Um, the three and a half people who work on our Kubernetes clusters at Aptio also work on Create. Um, so we have a team, but it is not our full time job, and we really don't want to maintain an also open source product like. I, I cannot stress this, you know, we have enough work without having to you know, manage pull requests and all that kind of stuff. So if we want to build a community around something like this as a result of, of doing this here, then I would really, really appreciate that. I think it's um, you know, something that it's, it's a conceptual idea, but I'm by no means going to claim that it's good code and it's the right solution. Anyone else? Back middle. Yeah, so the, the Terraform help provider and also the Terraform Kubernetes provider were two things that we looked at. And there's a fantastic fork of the Terraform Kubernetes provider, which was something that we looked at. And then what we realized for the Kubernetes specific provider is we'd have to rewrite all those Helm charts. And that seemed a little bit daunting. And then the actual Helm provider, I think when we started looking at this, it wasn't being maintained or isn't being maintained. I'm not really sure of the status of that. But again, we use Terraform to provision our AWS infrastructure anyway. So if, if something actually springs up around Terraform specifically, I think that would be the way we would go. Um, what's nice about this instead of Terraform is that you can actually generate those manifests and try them out. But I can definitely see a use case where you could do Terraform generate and it would generate those manifests in YAML and try that out. Um, so yeah, you know, I actually, uh, I, don't, I don't see him, but I actually I begged Mitchell to come, Mitchell Hashimoto to come here today so that he would take this on um, instead of us because he has a whole company to do that. Um, so, you know, th these are definitely things that we considered. Any other questions? Again.
No, we haven't heard about a ship, airship. That sounds interesting, and I will talk to you more about that after this. Final questions. Eric. Well, the, 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 the manifest that's generated by our tool, to repeat the question, um, the consumer is essentially any kubectl-based tool. So it's, it's a bog-standard kubectl manifest. Um, so it's, it's applyable with kubectl apply. It's, you know, you can turn into JSON and send it to the Kubernetes API. Um, it's, it's stuff that we as humans can read and understand. And, you know, I, definitely the workflow that I go through when I'm writing components is I'll write some components and then I'll generate the manifest and I'll kubectl apply it. And then I'll actually go and hand edit the, cube C the, the manifest to make it work. And then I'll go back and port that into the JSON. So it's really nice having that actual YAML there to actually be able to manipulate it and change it that way. Uh, it's a really nice workflow. All right, thanks everybody for listening. If you want to talk some more about this, I'll be here. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you.